cars are continuing to get smarter, and that's all thanks to the chips powering the brains of our vehicles. Joining me now to discuss more is Nicole DeGaulle. He's Senior Vice President and General Manager of Automotive and Cloud Computing at Qualcomm. Thanks so much for joining me today, Nicole. Great to see you. Great to see you again. Yes. So what would you say are some of the key innovations right now that are powering the brains of our cars? You know, cars and chips have become highly interdependent. I think the car as a chassis has evolved. There's so much of technology that is going into these vehicles. They've all been software driven. Gen AI, which is the two words of uh, 2023, they are entering the vehicle and they're going to make a massive impact in terms of how we consume technology, how we evolve experiences as we consume these, uh, these new mobility platforms. So as we now enter 2024, how is Qualcomm taking artificial intelligence to the next level in the vehicle? Yeah, for us, you know, the car is really this platform that has a massive amount of, of ability to absorb new technology. The car as a platform is changing. EVs have become so much more standard. People are trying to understand what this new platform means. It is providing the opportunity for automakers to really be able to change the product to have so many different experiences. Let me, let me give you some examples. What Genia is able to do is really to be able to allow uh, industries to have tools that allow you to be able to transform how you search, how you look for better outcomes, how you remember what you were doing in the past, look for newer experiences. We are bringing all of that down to the vehicle. We are able to actually make our hardware so much more able to predict what it is that the customers want, provide much better context. And that is what is sitting on top of a very complex digital chassis that we've been building over the years that makes chips really uh, completely inseparable from the physical chassis of the vehicle. Yeah, so there's a lot of complex use cases and components that go into that digital chassis. So how do you go about working with the different automakers with their needs and, and working in tandem with them and perhaps the complex integrations that can be a result of these advancements that we're talking about here? See, I think for automakers uh, relying on partners that can help them with a platform that they can develop on on a reliable basis, on a long-term basis is very important. Because what is starting to happen is, uh, is in the past, chips were something that automakers knew from a distance. They cared more about the function that they were buying from their traditional tier one supply chain. That's no longer the case. Automakers are building software, they're building experiences. And for that, you have to be able to design the underlying chassis yourself. For that, you need partners. What we focused on is to build connectivity solutions and compute solutions for our customers. This allows them to be able to have a very reliable foundation on top of which they build different experiences. Those experiences require them to be able to work with a broad ecosystem of partners. We have a lot of joint partners. And then automakers want to do their own in-house innovation as well. That combination requires a tremendous amount of trust, tremendous amount of relying on each other for the long term, for being able to predict what you don't know will happen, but have answers for it. And we've been able to learn this. We've been able to build uh, deep partnerships with the customers because we invest in technology for the long run. We invest in silicon for the long run. We invest in the resources needed to understand the specific needs of the industry. So it is really an industry where you have to make a long-term commitment to the fact that you're going to you know, move with the ups and downs uh, in terms of what it takes. And I think Gen AI, for example, has become this new technology that, that everyone's talking about. We feel very good that the products that we've been building contemplated something like this. We have the headroom in our products to be able to bring this in to our customers in the timelines that they want to be able to make practical use of it. Right, and you talked about the long term, and so there's several factors at play here because you have uh, the product life cycle, then the cyclicality of the auto business. So how is Qualcomm navigating the marketplace with all of these dynamics at play? I mean, one thing that helps us quite a bit is we've always as a company been a company that has a long-term view on things. We don't necessarily think about technology or entering into a market for something that's a couple of years. It's always a much longer term horizon. Automotive certainly is a long term business. And with the kind of change that is going on in the automotive industry, where there is so much of new product introduction, it is evident that it's going to take time to mature. Customers have to be able to learn 
what the new product uh, requires, how the ecosystem will need to be able to catch up to the new product requirements, how customers will learn. All of that requires us to be able to think about how our product gets designed, first of all, and then how that product has to evolve and keep up with the changes. Because once you deploy it, you have to be able to support it for 10, 12, 15 years. It's something that we plan for upfront. We consult with our customers, we consult with our ecosystem, and then we put resources in place to be able to go make sure that that is supported. That's just how you have to go do it. Mm -hmm. So with the competitive landscape, because there are a lot of competitors out there vying for these key partnerships, what do you think is it that is making Qualcomm stand out in the here and now? I think first of all, you know, we started focusing on automotive uh, as a business about 10 years ago, very seriously, when none of these things were really uh, being discussed. There was no discussion around the cockpit or ADAS. We focused on it because we felt that this was an industry that was going to be able to benefit from a lot of the technology that we built, and, the, and this industry would evolve. We saw connectivity uh, as something that was starting to uh, take root and uh, start to get some benefits to, the, uh, to, to automotive. We've learned a lot uh, working with the, the entire ecosystem, and there are many different elements. You know, First of all, quality and safety are uh, important standouts that are quite different from consumer products. Consumer products inherently have much shorter life cycle, so you're always rushing to go to the next thing. And when you have to build products for the auto industry, of course, all of those things are important, but they have to be on the foundation of something that allows the auto industry to build a lot of trust with you, that requires credibility, that requires time, that requires you to be able to go do a lot of the right things. The other thing that we realized was that automotive is going to change so much over the coming uh, decade because it's become this uh, industry that is accelerating to absorb new technology. Automotive for the longest time didn't actually absorb a lot of technology. I think it's now kind of on the other side of the spectrum. And that means you have to be able to, uh, first of all, deal with a variety of different automakers that are all at different levels of maturity and ability to innovate. And that allows us to be able to you know, learn very quickly, uh, adapt based upon what specific changes we have to do in our roadmap to go support different types of customers. Uh, to answer your original question, there are a lot of different skills that you need to be able to have under the same umbrella. And I think we've been investing, we've been investing with uh, you know the people that we are bringing onto the teams, the roadmaps we are building, the relationships that we have put together. And I think automakers see that. This is no longer an industry that can afford experiment uh, or uh, you know, try out a new supplier, try out somebody who may have something that sounds interesting because there is a lot of competition. And so you have to be able to pick your partners carefully. So you talked about the roadmap and with the different parts of the ecosystem at play here, how do you make sure that you're deploying your internal resources in the right areas? Well, I think we have focused on three different domains. We focus on connectivity and everything that connects the vehicle within itself and to the cloud. We focus on the experiences inside the cabin, what we call our cockpit platforms. And then we focus on driver assistance and automated driving. And these are three big bets that we are making. And then we focus on services that connect the car to the cloud to be able to provide various insights. When you think of these four areas, uh, this is, in my mind, what is in the center of being able to create new, new utility value for the car. How does the automaker differentiate to their customer? How does the automaker create a new uh, business model to be able to monetize services? How do you keep your customers and your uh, passengers safe? How uh, do you build experiences that are always connected and evolving? Once you kind of pick that North Star, it really comes down to learning from the ecosystem, learning from customers, learning from what their customers want, and then being very nimble. I think the other piece that is uh, very unique about automotive is it has a massive ecosystem. There are so many different parties that are involved in building a vehicle, but you wouldn't naturally think about what their specific role is. Well, we become that ecosystem glue. We've been able to bring a lot of different kinds of companies together. One good example uh, was Salesforce. You know, Salesforce was a CRM company partnered with Qualcomm for us to be able to bring insights all the way down to the vehicle. This has now allowed us to be able to go open up uh, with our car to cloud platform, things that are happening at the edge that are visible to our automotive customers within a Salesforce environment that would otherwise not have been possible. So if you think about the distance between a CRM platform that sits in the cloud and what's happening at the edge, 
It's not even about chips, it's about how do you connect all these different experiences. There are so many such examples. So it really is a pretty fascinating time because you have to be able to have many different assets in place, many partnerships in place, that trust in place to be able to create uh, you know, what we've been able to build. What would you say is the biggest challenge right now facing the chip industry, you know, those players who are involved in this space? You know, I think the challenge really is, uh, you know, I mean, it depends upon who you are. Uh, if you are someone who is established, who understands uh, what your specific differentiators are, I feel like there are probably more opportunities than challenges because there's just so much of change that is going on. I think if you are somebody who is new to this business, who hasn't been uh, present for a long time, this is a business that requires time. Uh, this is not a business that's going to start to uh, pay you dividends right away. And so you do have to pick your specific areas of focus because you can't really go to everything. There is a lot of competition. You have to be good at many different things. It does require a lot of investment ahead of the curve. But, uh, you know, I think we, we really like uh, our position because we've been able to take a lot of assets that we have in the company and then build a strategy that allows us to be able to create a lot of differentiation for our customers around that. And then what do you think is the biggest thing that investors should be focused on right now when they're looking at the automotive chip market? I think there are a couple of things. One is the uh, chip content, the silicon content in cars is going to keep increasing. And especially as EVs become more and more mainstream, there will clearly be a lot more competition because the barrier to entry to building a car is going down. Automakers will differentiate based upon experiences, based upon features that are mostly software driven. As that happens, the sophistication of the semiconductor of silicon becomes very important for the automaker. What we are seeing across every single customer that we talk to is how quickly can they move towards being software first to being digital first and what they look for in us is how can we help them with that acceleration and the transformation. So, you know, what is going on that is very interesting in the auto industry is that the entire industry is shifting towards uh, this brand new powertrain, which is an EV powertrain, which creates a bit of a reset for every automaker who's been optimizing their supply chains, their manufacturing for a combustion engine. As you go do that, you are learning that there are many new skill sets that you have to have uh, very quickly because there is a lot of competition. There are a lot of newcomers coming in. For investors, I feel like the one thing that uh, they all recognize is that we've been able to make this transition from being a very mobile-centric company to really being a technology platform company that puts Snapdragon in the middle, puts our uh, compute and our connectivity technology in the middle, and really become a major difference maker in terms of helping automakers make that transition, make that uh, turn, because it's very important for, the, for this industry to be able to go do that very quickly. Well, Nicole, it was great checking in with you today. Thanks so much. Thank you very much.